Good morning and welcome. Hi, I'm Mike Cloudon. I'm CEO of the Milken Institute. And it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the very beginning of the formal portion, not including the informal portion yesterday, of the 18th annual Milken Institute Global Conference. And we're going to have a wonderful time. Uh, you're, going to be, uh, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be crowded at times. Uh, but you, for those of you who are first timers, know that it really works out well. Uh, there will be times when some sessions are full. Uh, particularly, I will note, giving you a little advance warning, that 10.45 this morning, when we don't have this room because it's set up for lunch, sessions are more likely to be full in the Executive Center, which are the somewhat smaller rooms than they will be at some other times. So if you've got something you really want to be in, be sure to get there in time for that. That doesn't mean you walk out of your 9.30 session uh, at, uh, you know, at 9.40, but just know that uh, that will happen. If your session's full, don't worry. Move on to the next one. There'll be a, uh, there are others, and the, everything is going to be online for you. So with just that little bit of, uh, of advice, let's get started. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to welcome our panel on. Our first panel is the return of volatility. Canary in the coal mine, and it's uh, a wonderful group of very experienced panelists who have been uh, with us uh, uh, in the past, and uh, I'm going to have them all come out, have their seats, and I want to introduce our moderator of the panel. Jillian Tett is the U.S. Managing Editor and Columnist of the Financial Times. Uh, at the FT, she's also served as Assistant Editor for Markets Coverage capital markets editor, and a reporter in Tokyo, London, Russia, and Brussels. She's a best-selling author, and her next book on the global economy and financial system is going to be published later this year. So please welcome me, uh, in, please join me in welcoming our host, Jillian Ted. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for that very kind welcome. And welcome to the first session of this year's Milken Conference called The Return to Volatility, Canary in the Coal Mine. I think the subtitle of that could be, yikes, what on earth is going to happen next? Because by any measure, the world has been through an extraordinary decade. First, we had a gigantic credit bubble. Then we had an even more shocking financial market um, collapse, if not bout of turbulence. And then we had a truly staggering policy response, which has in many ways tipped the global, global financial markets into the equivalent of Alice in Wonderland. Um, they reckon that about eight to $10 trillion worth of aid was provided by central banks in forms of quantitative easing and other unorthodox monetary policy experiments. We've had a debt increase of $57 trillion, according to McKinsey. Much of that actually has come from China. Um, and we also live today in a world of extraordinarily long, bo low bo bond yields. Um, around a third of the sovereign debt market right now has got negative yields. You have a number of companies, su um, such as Nestle, which are issuing at negative yields. It's an extraordinary, unprecedented time. And yet, in spite of all of that aid, we still have a global economy that is, at best, pretty spluttering. I was noticing that in this morning's Financial Times, which I hope you've all read, that American companies are on track, according to my colleague Ed Luce, for about a trillion dollars of buybacks this year. We've also got a world where people are warning not just about Grexit, potentially creating all kinds of contagion risks, but Ukraine, China, many other places as well. So are we heading for significant volatility? And if so, will that be good or bad? Because, of course, the dirty secret about volatility is that we journalists love volatility. It helps sell papers. It helps create news. But many of you in the room also love volatility because it creates enormous opportunities for arbitrage and for all kinds of financial profits. So we have a terrific panel of people to talk about where the world is going. Um, I think many of them are very, very well known to you. Um, on my far right, um, your left, is Alex Friedman, who is CEO of GAM. Next to me, uh, immediately next to me, is Josh Friedman, who is co-founder of Canyon, again, I think known to many of you. On 
my left, your right, um, again, is a man who's very well known to you, who's been a veteran of these conferences, um, who is Josh Harris, who is a co-founder of Apollo. On his, on his left, your right, is um, Alan Howard, co-founder of Brevin Howard. And at the very end, we have Kerry Lathrop, who's head of global credit at City. So we have a number of asset managers and one lonely banker who's going to tell us what's happening in the world. Unusual to see the bankers outnumbered, but I'm sure you'll do well. <laughs> so I'd like to start perhaps with Alex and ask you, when you look at the year ahead, are you worried about an explosion in volatility? You know, I, I spoke on this panel last year, and what I hoped is that nobody would remember what I said a year ago, because <laughs> I'm sure a big chunk of it is wrong. So um, to that question, <clears throat> I expect that some point over the next four to six months, we'll see real volatility in the market. will pull back something like 10%, and that that'll be a good buying opportunity, because I basically think we have about two years left in this central bank-supported risk-on run, so to speak. Because um, when, you, when you think about the big drivers, and I, I'm not smart enough to get beyond the big drivers, so I try to stick with them, we've got pretty much everybody easing. Yes, the United States is heading in the other direction, but slowly. Um, so you got a lot of easing, you have cheap energy, and you've got falling currencies in some of the more kind of worrisome areas, particularly in Europe. All of those support risk, risk on. But more importantly, there's that quote from Abraham Lincoln, life is a choice among alternatives. And there really isn't an alternative right now other than risk assets, I would argue, given what you just referenced, which is negative yields in much of um, kind of the traditional sovereign world. So volatility, yes. Um, buying opportunities, still a couple of years of this kind of um, rising tide environment, but shifting more to fundamentals. Right. So a world where everyone's been grabbing for risk. Um, I mean, history suggests that very rarely ends well. Um, you know, every five to eight years, we have big market reset, right? 87, 94, 90, 98, 2001, 2008. So we'll probably do that, so to speak. Um, so what, what would be the not end well uh, story. You know, in the near term, we've got a lot of political risk, which I, I'd say is not fully priced into the market. Um, longer term, I think we've got huge structural issues around liquidity, which I know we're going to talk about. And then the thing that worries me the most is, uh, as, as investors are forced further out on the risk curve, you're starting to now see the most traditional pension funds reallocating. And as they reallocate, the implications to the elderly are not factored in, because they have huge social structural implications. You have indebted nations that all of a sudden are going to have to be bailing out their elderly who thought they had fixed income savings to retire on and won't have it. Right. Well, certainly history also suggests it's usually the dumbest money that jumps on the trend at the last minute. Mm -hmm. But um, Alan, do you think we're heading for another crisis? If they, do you think that you know, every five to eight years there's a big round of market turbulence? So I think, I think the market is inherently the, um, extremely unstable in the structure we have today was has been since the financial crisis, and that's partly due to the regulatory uh, effects that have happened in changing the way banks, uh, liquidity banks offer. Um, so uh, the, clearly, as we know, we've had some uh, small events, such as October 15th and, the, and a much larger one in terms of the SMB um, uh, moving the peg. But both of these ex are examples where uh, the change of market infrastructure has meant that whenever we get events, the volatility that they produce is uh, of a magnitude what we haven't seen before. So I think the real issue is that um, do any of these small events ever lead into something bigger? And, um, that, and we'll have to see if we get something which is more fundamental based um, in, fu in the future. Right, right. Josh, what do you make of the current climate? Are you concerned about the potential for a nasty shock in the next year or so? I realize, by the way, we, we've managed to have two Joshes and two Friedmans. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I can pass on any question I want. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. You can fight for which question you answer. Exactly. But I'm surrounded by Josh's. So, yes. so um, I think it's, it's sometimes it's easier to prepare than predict. I, I think when you have um, unnatural interference on a global basis with, uh, with financial markets, you get built up imbalances, and they build up and they build up and build up. And it's a little bit like that last little grain that you put on the sand pile, and then all of a sudden the top of it collapses. Um, last year, we actually had quite a lot of volatile events take place. There were some significant um, out of the ordinary major adjustments in, in certain areas. You had obviously what happened with the Swiss franc, um, and, and I think that caught most 
macro players by surprise. Uh, what happened in oil prices was extreme, really extreme. I think the rise of ISIS is something that was generally not predicted by the general public. Um, you've now had the Fed uh, so intent on not surprising people on interest rate that, they, that they've warned people to the point where when they do actually raise rates, it'll be a shock. So um, I think sometimes the best thing to do is just know that eventually all of these unnatural build up, build ups in disequilibria will produce an adjustment, but rather than to spend too much time predicting when they'll happen, maybe it's better just to prepare. Right, right, well, just to prepare. Josh, the other Josh, you can be the Josh other too. Josh, the other Josh, and I, I've never been described as a veteran of conferences, so I maybe have to stop uh, speaking or something. Um, so I, I think, Look, I, to follow up on what Alan said, there's been a change in the structure of the markets. So the, the, the people that used to make the markets were the banks, uh, and the banks have been driven out of doing that. And so who's replaced them? Really the people on the stage. So if you think about the U.S. fixed income market, more than a third of it now is daily liquidity vehicles. So what happens when retail decides to move out of... So daily liquidity vehicles are buying assets that probably don't have daily liquidity in the event of a shock. So. When something bad happens, you're going to see, as Alan was saying, an amplification of sort of a trend down because the people that actually have to step in and buy are going to have, you know, much higher, they're, they're going to set the price of risk in a much more aggressive way. Um, you know, now there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. You know, we ourselves have 30 billion of unspent capital, so there's definitely people that will ultimately step in, <clears throat> but there'll be um, sort of volatility, volatility within a range. I don't think it's necessarily bad for the system. Uh, because I think that ultimately uh, probably having people like the people on the stage setting the price of risk is probably better in some way than massive uh, government-backed, taxpayer-backed institutions that are cross-collateralized. But I think that it is what it is. The structure has changed to a much more institutionalized market, which will create opportunities when things go down more aggressively and has created opportunities. When we, you know, you saw the, uh, a lot of these markets are not that liquid. The high yield market when, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, some of the fiscal issues in the U.S. or when oil cracked, you know, you saw the, you saw the high yield market trade off, you know, five, 10 points. You saw names trade off 20, 30 points and, and you'd buy a little bit of it and they'd trade back up 10 or 15 points. And so that's kind of the market that we live in today. They're just less liquid. Um, the other thing is, I think there's just gonna be um, <clears throat> sort of, sort of, sort of regional bouts. There, there already is a volatility in certain industries and certain structures. So, you know, in natural resources, in commodities, um, you know, there's volatility. Why? You know, the dollar is going up, uh, China is slowing down. Um, in, in retail, uh, where the internet is remaking uh, certain sectors, there's volatility. In energy, there's volatility. So I'm not sure you're gonna see, with the, with the central banks sort of, you know, I've got your back policies, uh, and zero rates. I don't know that you're going to see broad-based volatility like you saw uh, in the last financial crisis, but you may see rolling structural volatility around different industries, around different companies, around different markets, uh, around different regional areas. Right. Well, let's take that issue of regulatory risk first, because I know it's something that obviously Kerry's been looking at closely from the bank's perspective. Um, and then I'll come on to some of the geopolitical or potential geopolitical um, triggers for volatility. But just how bad, Kerry, is this mismatch in the bond markets today? Because post-2008, we've seen the broker-dealers reduce their inventories by about 70%, I think, is the current figure um, out there. Um, that's a big decline that has created, as Josh says, mismatches and pockets of potential considerable illiquidity. Um, we are seeing the industry squealing. I mean. Those of you who have not yet read your FT this morning, and I hope you all have, um, may not have seen that we have a piece this morning about how um, bankers are appealing for changes in the trace reporting system because of concern about the lack of liquidity. Um, is this going to be the next spark or the spark for the next crisis, do you think? Um, I, do, I do think so. I share the, uh, the concern that's been expressed by many of the, uh, the panelists, though I don't think it's probably a 2015 story because I think ultimately it's going to take rates rising and even if the uh, the Fed does raise rates later this year it's likely to be the front end that moves and it's probably not the tenure or the longer end 
But on the issue of, uh, of regulation, you know, I think probably that's one of the charts that more clients will you know, throw in front of me. And you'll see uh, dealer balances pre-crisis go from 250 billion to roughly you know, 40 or 50 billion, depending on when you look at that. Do you have a, I think you have a chart. Is that one of the graphs? No, this, this is okay. just dealer. All dealer, right, that's uh, suspense. We have some more charts coming later, but not yet. That's just dealer balance sheets. And you know, the reality is you know, some of that is overstated. If you think about it, you, know, you took out Lehman, Bank America, and Merrill, probably one and one didn't equal two. It may equal one and a half, it may equal one. Same thing with Bear Stearns. So you took capacity out of the market, but there's no question we've shrunk balance sheets. There was a lot of prop activity that were sitting in banks that really weren't there for the benefit of our clients, per se, which you know, bulk up that number. But there's no question directionally that's, that's correct. And part of it is not top-down coming from me, it's bottom-up. You know, the cost, uh, if you think about how we used to finance ourselves in the inventory, there's a lot more equity today, long-term debt, which is just more costly. So it either means that bid offers have to widen out to compensate a market maker for using the balance sheet, or there's just got to be greater velocity in the balance sheet. So right. there's clearly been some element of regulation, but I think as Alan touched on, some of it is structural. There have just been changes. The buy side has grown much more than the sell side. We could double our balance sheet, you'd still have this problem. Um, and I think the point that Josh talk, talked about, just the daily liquidity, you have this mismatch. And when you think about what happened in the crisis, it was really that. Where are you funding long-term assets with short-term liabilities? You can look at things like the structured investment vehicles, which are really funding themselves in the commercial paper market and buying longer dated assets. And when that market seized up, they couldn't yeah. roll their liabilities. Right. And I think, again, that's what everyone's looking for. It's what is that catalyst? What's that one grain of sand <clears throat> that causes the whole system to collapse and everyone to run? And, you know, the challenges, I think, are that different from, oh, you know, the crisis where you would have large market moves. And if you think about what really drives that as a market maker, because you have this imbalance very quickly, you know, if high yield, if you think about last summer, is at 5%, it looks like there's sellers. Very quickly, the market moves to 6%, 7% to try to create equilibrium so that the sellers become holders or maybe buyers. Right. So then what happens is the buyers come in and they say, like, what can you offer? Really not a lot because there's not an inventory around. New issue shuts down because borrowers in their mind were thinking that they could borrow at five. Today it's at seven. They want to, it takes a while to recalibrate. So what happens is it immediately snaps back and maybe it ends up at five and a half. In a more orderly market, you would watch things tick from kind of five to five and a half. Right. Today, and that's where I think all of us probably agree, where the opportunity is, is when it goes down, you have to buy whatever you can, because when you look and see what actually traded, not a lot trades when it goes down right. from five to seven, and not a lot trades when it goes from seven to five and a half. Right. And I think that's just one of the challenges that we're all dealing with. And I think the markets are very, very prone to that type of volatility right. Right. in the future. I mean, it does strike me as a terrible irony of 2008 that everyone agreed the crisis was caused by too much debt and a mismatch in terms of the duration, asset liability mismatch on the part of many vehicles. So what happens now? We have a market with even more debt out there and even more potential mismatches in terms of the liquidity mismatches. Um, but Alan, would you agree? Because, you know, we've all heard the banks talk about the problem of illiquid markets and the regulatory changes. And yet there's an argument to be made that, you know, markets are responding with entrepreneurial zeal to find other ways to plug that gap. And we don't have to have a world dominated by bankers. So I think the first thing is um, that uh, we should add some other points of what's happened to in terms of regulation and liquidity. And then, and then that's how, uh, how I think the central bankers are looking at the way forward for them, the, the way the market's going to uh, the structure of the market. So I think not only are the banks' um, uh, inventories coming down, but the way that the, they behave in terms of offering liquidity has changed. Number one, there's been a junior, juniorization of the desks. Uh, in other words, they try, because uh, they have more pressure on terms of um, cutting costs and making each um, business more uh, uh, RE effective, they're clearly cutting the uh, imply, uh, using uh, more, much more junior people on those trading desks. Second thing is Dodd-Frank has meant that people really have no idea how much of their risk limit they're really allowed to use. For example, if a, if a, a, um, 
a market maker has a specific amount of risk limit, he will never use it anymore because he's concerned that if he prepositions for a trade or, or trades after uh, from an account but has not got the liquidity on the other side, he may retrospectively have been said that he was doing some proprietary trading and not market making and therefore get in trouble, have his money clawed back, etc. So market makers are not behaving at all ha uh, even within their risk limit. Thirdly, and that's, that's exacerbated at times of stress. Um, then the next thing to look at is um, the idea that uh, the idea that the central banks had was to move products to central CCP, central cl 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 uh, c c um, counterparty clearing. And what's happened there, it's been very, very slow. And now there's been a lot of pushback from the banks about the specific risk of that clearing house if too much product goes to, to there. So that's another thing that's... Um, uh, uh, taking a long time to get to. Uh, there's also, um, we've done hardly anything on that, on that late. Um, now, add that together with, as I mentioned, the October 15th and the SMB have changed the risk VAR model-wise um, uh, that banks and uh, are willing to offer because after the SMB shock, which was a so-called liquid product, they can't uh, model uh, with VAR the way they used to. So we're ending up with this lack of liquidity is forcing more and more uh, investors to use standardized products to hedge their portfolios. Uh, so the 10 or so 15 liquid products, whatever the number is, that are fate world, world, world used by everybody are being used even more in, and increasing the open interest in those products to a level whereby whenever we get a small shock and positioning is one way, such as October 15th, you get outsized moved in these so-called liquid markets. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's a big deal. And then, so we're moving towards a structure where the banks, the, 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 the central banks are not going to go backwards. They're going to, they're not going to let the banks take more OTC product. We're going to go to a structure of CCPs, will take time, uh, less market making by the banks, more standardized products, um, and electronic exchanges between buy side firms. Right. That's the way we're going to. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it's inherently a very different structure. And as Josh said, it means that you are, uh, you're going to get these large moves occasionally, but we don't know if those large moves will ever actually follow through into something bigger. Right, That's Josh and then Alex. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, the, 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 the institutions that caused the last financial crisis were the banks. They were the largest things out there. And I totally agree. We're all talking a lot about the fact that they've been, um, in essence, somewhat pushed out of the market in terms of the market maker function. But I think it's actually, they're, they're much less leveraged. They've got a lot more equity. They're, they're getting out of the risk businesses. So I think ultimately, um, the, qu the real question is systematically, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for the system. I do think that there'll be volatility within a range, but again, just the, just the amount of capital that's sitting on the sideline, you know, waiting. We've all been waiting for years now. We've all been talking about this same phenomena, and it doesn't, it, when it's happened, when there's been brief bouts of volatility, you can't buy anything. So the minute you step in and buy something, it goes right back up. So the real question is, you know, more fundamental, I think. I think the system, you know, it's, it's sort of like choosing your poison. If you make the banks massive, uh, to the point where they're impossible to deal with if they get in trouble uh, and very difficult to manage, you get, um, the, the, they may be willing to step in a bit, uh, but you may have, maybe have right. created a larger systematic issue. I think we're kind of in a better place. Right. I said I was talking with a group of central bankers recently who said to me, well, back in 2008, they'd hoped that endowments and other asset managers would be liquidi liquidity providers <coughs> in the crisis. And of course, that hope turned out to be completely wrong. So some of them were suggesting actually maybe next time round the central banks themselves will have to step in and be essentially the market of last resort. Alex, are you concerned about what will happen? I mean, are you willing to be a big liquidity provider in a crisis? Well, I, I think actually you, you reference a point which is really important, which is that um, central bankers hoped. Hope is an important point because I think we all want to think that there's some omnipotent force that's going to fix things, and central bankers have stepped into the void in the past, and they've been that. But I think Alan may have referenced the Swiss National Bank. When they put the peg on, I was living in Switzerland, and I think I somehow learned that they had no idea what their exit plan was. They knew they wanted to put the peg on, but they didn't know how they were going to get off of it, which is, to me, very illustrative of, you know, central bankers are people, and they do their best in the current situation, but they can't obviously foresee all of the consequences. But it gets worse when they're not driving the story, so to speak. And that's, to me, the big volatility inflection point we're at right now, which is basically the central bankers have done 
I'd say the vast majority of what they can do across the board. And so we're shifting to the fiscal side, which is inherently more messy at a time when there's lots of elections coming up, both in Europe and then downstream in the United States. And you get into the known unknown, unknown unknown Donald Rumsfeld thing. The elections coming up are the known unknowns, right? Greece is the most analyzed known unknown there is. I don't think that's what, at least from my perspective, derails everything. Um, you know, would the UK uh, leave the Eurozone or w would the hung parliament, you'd know better than me, lead to instability in that regard? You know, possibly. But what's happening tragically in Nepal today is a reminder that, you know, the unknown unknowns can really derail the story. And the odds are there will be one of them of scale in the next 12 to 18 months. So then you get to Josh's point, which is, right. fine, how do you position yourself against that? Right. I would, I would just add that the, I, I'd like to echo a point that Josh made, which was that well, for, first of all, crises come generally from the credit world. I mean, unless you have massive amounts of leverage by common stocks at the retail level, which isn't the situation, hasn't been for many years, the worst crises come from overshoot on credit. And we've clearly had pressure through, you know, systematic easing globally that's caused uh, disequilibria and buildup. But the institutional framework is so different now, maybe they've actually achieved the purpose that they were trying to achieve, which is to get, instead of have all the risk in, a, in concentrated mismatches that are actually located within the banks, instead you have a shadow banking system that's actually quite functional. You have many, many institutions, like a lot of the people uh, represented on this stage, who basically run either very unleveraged or very lightly leveraged institutions that don't have daily liquidity, but are able to provide those uh, provide capital to the market at the moment when the mismatched institutions such as, you know, we, we all get worried when we see ETFs buying bank debt that trades T plus 30 if you're lucky enough to have someone beating up the lawyer on the other side every day um, and they have T plus one money. So it doesn't yeah. really, that's a mismatch. But there are so many institutions that don't have that mismatch that have longer duration capital that aren't terribly leveraged. And there's plenty of people who I think learned in 08 that providing capital to those types of institutions post a crisis represented by a downdraft in prices is a good thing to do right. and a very profitable thing to do that I'm maybe a little less worried about the systematic risks of the overshoot. Although I do think it's clear that we have an overshoot in credit today. I mean, Josh, do you feel functional? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's important as you get older. Um, to, to, to 2008, the government did, the government was the last sort of firewall and you know the Fed and the US government guaranteed 20 trillion dollars of liabilities. I think it's the same thing. I, I really believe if you were to have a 2008 style crisis, that would have to happen again. But once that happened, the people that would be actually pricing risk would be pricing it with their own money, with their clients' money, it, you know, in a much more analytical, systematic way than off of a large balance sheet. I think that's ultimately um, so I don't think ultimately that the people that would have to step in have really changed, and I don't think, uh, I do think the people that would ultimately make the markets uh, are asset managers at this point and not banks. There's one um, issue I think in the asset management world that might be worth pausing on, uh, which could cause volatility, which is the rise of passive instruments, which make a lot of sense given that you've had a rising tide environment, so they've done well. Um, they're a bit of a blunt instrument, and so often people who hold passive instruments aren't quite clear of what, what they actually hold. So last fall, when you saw kind of the high-yield ETF sell-off, it was because they had a lot of exposure to energy. Yeah. If you ask a lot of the kind of asset allocators who allocated, they were um, a bit more surprised than they probably should have been. And I think you're seeing a version of that in China right now, where you know Chinese exposure from an ETF perspective is, um, is, is, has been a good investment, uh, but China's slowing. And it shouldn't actually be such a rising kind of dynamic as an instrument. And there will be a period where kind of the market catches up with the economics. And it may be that asset management itself, as it goes through its own evolution, also influenced by monetary policy, is going to produce instability. So it's a bit like back in 2007 or 2008, when lots of mainstream investors woke up and realized that actually what was sitting inside their CDOs was not quite what they right. expected. Exactly. Um, and had some nasty shocks. I guess at this point, though, it's quite a good moment. Um, unless, Kerry, do you want to come in? I realize as the loan banker on the panel, I think maybe Lonely. you should get four times <laughs> the loan brave banker on the panel. Um, you should get, get a word on this before we move on to some of the geopolitical risks. Is there anything you'd like to add on this issue of whether asset managers are going to save the system next time? Yeah, I, th I think one of the uh, 
you know, the, the challenges you have, if you look, and again, we, we touched on, you know, regulation being one of the issues, but one of the challenges is, is a changing market structure. And I think broadly defining asset managers, you know, is probably not right. You have to look, you know, you know which we've touched on here, you know, which are managers that have caught daily liquidity or very short-term liquidity, and which are the managers who have much longer-term liquidity. Yeah. And those are the ones, the latter group, who can step in because I think whatever it is that event, and it's, I agree with Alex, it's not going to be the known unknowns. It'll be something we don't anticipate that causes the flows to move. And unfortunately, I think with just some of the change in market structure, if you look today, I'd say more of the market is, you know, called total rate of return money. So, you know, when prices are going down, they're going to tend to sell. And it's not like maybe insurance and pension or maybe yield driven. And if you go back 20 or 30 years, there was more of that type of buyer who would be a shock absorber for the market. So, you know, when you say who are the asset managers will step in, it has to be those who have longer term structural liquidity. Right. So if they buy something and it's down five points and it goes down another five points, they don't get forced out of the trade. Right. But Josh makes a really important point, though, which is the last crisis, we, certainly we and a lot of people made a lot of money, a lot of money, waiting, 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 and then stepping in. And so the markets didn't clear. They, re they really gapped. And the people that ultimately cleared the markets they cleared them at much lower levels than fundamental value. And that was highly lucrative and very profitable for many of us. Like everyone saw that uh, and everyone's waiting for that. There's just a, a lot of people are saying kind of when's the next 08, you know, all the things that we're pointing out. So I just don't, I just don't unfortunately believe it's gonna be that simple this time around. I think you're gonna have to be, I think, it, I think you're gonna have to be much smarter and opportunistic about how you play industries and regions and other things. I don't think you're gonna have this broad-based pullback. We even see it, we see it today, even in you know, the stress landscape where Josh and I play, the, 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 the level of returns today are just not what they were. Uh, there's a lot, there's, there's many more institutional players, they sort of sit there and they wait for any kind of pullback energy, which we'll, we should get into at some point. You know, kind of the sort of vocal drumbeat of, hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know, I think caused people to be a little bit early in that market relative to fundamentals. So um, I just don't, I don't believe that um, we're going to have the opportunity uh, that we all had, um, you know, kind of um, in a way. And, if this, and sort of the flip side of that is I think the system won't really break down as much as it did in 08. Right. Which is a good thing if you're a regulator or a mainstream investor. It may not be quite so good for, for you guys, but... Who, who, um, and, and our institutional right. clients that are yeah. endowments and pension funds. Right. And well, listen, let's change the conversation a bit, and let's look at some of the triggers that could actually spark this volatility. And I'm going to check that you and the audience are still awake after this discussion about market structure <laughs> um, and regulatory reform, and ask you all a couple of questions. So a quick show of hands for those of you who are still awake. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask you when you think the next U.S. rate rise will be. Will it be June, this autumn, or not at all this year, probably next year? So all of you who think there's going to be a U.S. rate rise in June, hands up. Janet Yellen has done her work. <laughs> Those of you who weren't looking around can see that's apparently nobody, or else you all are truly either asleep or very, very shy. All of you who think there's going to be a rate rise in the autumn. Okay. And those of you who think there will not be a rate rise at all this year. Wow. That is a lot more bearish than I would have expected. Um, any of you want to comment on that? Do you think a rate rise is coming and will it be one of the sparks for a potential round of volatility? Uh, well, I'll comment. I mean, I, I think that... The, I think the Fed, so you're saying U.S. rate rise because everyone yes. else is going the other way. Look, I think the Fed is in a very, has a very difficult decision to make, and I think that they're uh, really um, kind of thinking about it and gritting, gritting their teeth, and um, I think it's unclear. I think they, I think they really want to get off of zero rates because, you know, they see the unemployment numbers going down. Um, and they know that eventually the U.S. economy is going to get inflationary, and so they don't want to overshoot, which is actually, you know, a pretty significant tail risk. Um, having said that, um, you know, the data more recently has been negative, and I don't think that, I think this movement in the dollar um, has surprised people in terms of its effect on the economy. The conventional uh, wisdom was that net exports are a pretty small number, 
movements in the dollar don't really matter that much. Uh, and I think that um, that conventional wisdom is being challenged right now. Um, and earnings have been pretty poor. And so I think ultimately, um, and, and I think lastly, so I think you've got this on the one hand, on the other hand story for them. And my guess is I think they're naturally dovish. Mm -hmm. um, they naturally uh, want to, you know, be very cautious about derailing what they see as, you know, a somewhat slow U.S. recovery. So my guess is um, they, they're not going to act in June, and I think as you get closer to year end, um, they're going to be worried about Christmas. Right. And so my guess is that ultimately it's a January. Um, I, I, I think they're going to want to do this next year, early next wow. year. And I think, so unless, but I think they're, they, you know, they're, they're very focused on conditions dependent, right? So everything that I'm saying, if we, if we started having 300,000 job ads every month between now and December, they might move. But I, I just, I think that's not going to happen right. because of the strength of the dollar. So I think they're going to move it to next year. Right. Um, Alex, would you agree? I mean, half the people in the room think that it's not going to happen this year? Yeah, I, I guess um, I, would, I would slightly differ with Josh in, in that um, I do agree that the Fed is naturally dovish. Um, but I also think they're very cued into valuations in the risk markets right now. And I was struck by kind of only 2% in the last 40 years has the PE for the S&P ever been higher. Uh, on almost any measure now, it's getting reasonably high, I, I'd argue. And there are all these downstream implications, which you know we we touch on. I'm happy to go into more. So, so my guess is that they would they will uh, make a move in the fall, um, but that it will be smaller than expected, and they'll start to telegraph basically very incremental moves, um, which to me is Janet Yellen threading between um, the data that Josh alluded to, the effect of the dollar, and her real desire to get off of the levels that they're on right now. Right. Any of you think it could happen in June? Harry. No, I'm, I'm more later, but I think the point that Alex raises there, I think, is one I mean, people really don't talk about is, you know, regulators are trying to use macroprudential policy, you know, to allow them to keep rates lower for longer. But, you know, the point that Josh made about distressed, you know, for the first time probably in 10 years where it used to have, let's say, distressed investors say, okay, I want to earn a 20% unlevered return. Then it was 15. And as returns get compressed, what do they do? For the, you know, you're, for the first time you have investors saying, okay, let me buy something that yields eight, that I have higher confidence in, put eternal leverage on it to get the double digit return that I need for my clients. Because in a world of prolonged low rates, you know, how do pension and endowments or insurance companies generate the types of returns? So you are starting to see, we all know that one turn of leverage turns into two turns of leverage, turns into three turns of leverage. Why is so much money flowing into credit, you know, high yield? Why is money flowing in, you know, out duration, you know? There was an issue um, a couple weeks ago in, uh, in Europe, uh, Mexico, and I think it could be the trade of the year, but um, they issued 100-year bonds in euros. It was a billion and a quarter. And you have to ask yourself, is there that much natural duration risk for 100-year yeah. Mexico bonds? And by the way, they issued it at 430 yield. It rallied six or seven points on the break. So, you know, it's trading now below 4%. At some point, it's not crazy to think that that could trade at six yeah. percent. That's a sixty-six and three-quarter dollar price. If it traded at eight percent, still not a crazy number. It's a fifty-dollar price. Now, it's one thing if you're asset hedged, asset liability matched. You have a liability on the other side that hopefully goes up in value by fifty points, so you can absorb the mark to market. But if you're not, if you're just buying that because you need yield, what's the only thing you can do if you think it's going to go down like that is to sell it. You know, and I think, you know, you can see and you understand why investors are moving like that because they're getting squeezed, but it just sets you up for more volatility right. Right. and investors are going in places because, you know, again, in a prolonged period of very low rates, you know, whether it's, you know, retirees, you know, it, it's hard yeah. to make, you know, business models work in zero rates. Well, that raises a very interesting question, which is, um, I was back chatting recently to some of Janet Yellen's former colleagues who pointed out the issue really isn't when the rate rise occurs, it's how fast rates go up. And they said to me, maybe what we should do is try and visualize Janet Yellen in a swimming pool, which is a strange, a strange image, but imagine Janet Yellen in a swimming pool with a giant beach ball. And she's standing next to you and holding that giant beach ball underwater under your chin. And essentially saying, not yet, not yet, not yet, and just when you start to relax, 
She lets go of that beach ball and it shoots up out of the water and hits you hard in the face. Um, the point being, if you can imagine that vision of Janet Yellen with her beach ball underwater, that sometimes things can float to the surface very, very fast by way of reaction. I mean, does that worry you, Alan, that never I mind Janet Yellen in the swimming pool? <laughs> but <laughs> I think she won't let the, it blow that the, fast. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, no, I the think vision that, of you know, the rates suddenly shooting up much faster than people expect. I think there's two things. Firstly, I think that there's a big difference, as Alex said, that they want to get off the zero bound. A lot of them have a problem with being rates of zero. That is not a hike in their mind. And um, they will, as, as they move off zero, they will, data dependent, make it clear by easing in forward space one way or the other to ensure that monetary conditions stay easy. So I don't think at all that they will allow uh, the market to think that they're going to be hiking very quickly or in any way to allow other asset prices to sell off dramatically because after seven, eight years of zero rates, the last thing they want is a small hike of 25 or 50 basis points to cause an Armageddon. So I don't think there's any chance of that beach ball going too high initially. Now, maybe a year later, we'll have to see how does the rates going, say, to 51% with Europe and Japan still in easing mode, how does that affect the dollar and how does that affect as Josh said, um, market uh, other uh, the corporate America, and uh, maybe that will affect the rate, the, the the pace, and the amount they hike at. All right. What about you? Are you concerned about that beach ball jumping up fast, or do you think they can keep it rising slowly and steadily up through the water? I, I do find that Janet Yellen image disturbing on all sorts of levels, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, um, I, I guess. It was interesting to see the result of your poll because the Fed has managed, obviously, to convince everyone that they're never raising rates. Because if you took this poll last year, you would have thought it was earlier, and it's just moved out and moved out and moved out. And they've done it to the point that when they actually raise it, I do think it will surprise everybody because no one really believes they're going to raise rates. And they have raised rates on a relative basis because of the negative rates we're seeing in Europe and elsewhere globally. So in some sense, you could say rates are already quite high in the US relative to other, other places where you can deploy capital. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's very, very difficult uh, for us to figure out a way to actually make money predicting rates. Um, and, I, and I think that the exact timing and the speed at with which they increase it um, are, are equally difficult to, right. to predict. And I think the world's littered with brilliant economists who've gotten this wrong so many times in the past. Right. So, so I think the, the thought is how do you protect yourself by trying to avoid things that are negative optionality? Um, how do you avoid the credit bubbles that are taking place in the system? And there are credit bubbles in the system. You look at the 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 paucity of transactions that have covenants in them. Uh, it's, it's no comparison even to what it was in 2007. There are literally no bank deals today right. uh, practically at all that have significant covenant protection for lenders. Um, on the other hand, you don't have the massively leveraged institutions holding these securities, so maybe there's less danger. Um, I, I tend to think that the Fed's not going to want to do something that's too drastic, uh, too quick, too severe, uh, although I've heard people on the other side, and I, I don't know, I don't know, but I do know that going out on the risk spectrum in today's environment seems like an awfully, awfully dangerous thing to do to me, given um, where high yield is, where bank debt is, et cetera. So we've just been avoiding it. And yet many people are going out on the risk spectrum, as Alex says. Um, well, let's try another poll then, another potential risk. Um, I'm going to ask you in the audience to vote on two things. One is, will we have a Greek default in the next six months? And secondly, will we have Grexit? So will we have a Greek default and will we have Grexit? So those of you who think that Greece will default in the next six months, put your hands up. OK, those of you who don't, just to check again, we're not getting a bias. So 50-50 on default and Grexit. Who expects to see Grexit? Not many of you. Who expects to not to, that Greece will stay part of the Eurozone? Wow. So not only has Ang uh, Janet Yellen convinced many of you, but it looks like Angela Merkel has convinced most of you, because <coughs> not only the power of persuasive strong women, um, not only have, is about half of you not expecting to see Greek default, but only a very small minority of you are expecting to see Grexit. Alex, or maybe I shall ask Alan. Alan, is that too complacent? Uh, I don't know if it's, comp I think it is a bit complacent, yes, because two things. I think the first thing is, as you said about Merkel, I think that the Ru what's going on in Russia and Ukraine is clearly preoccupying her. Um, so she doesn't want a, Gre a Grexit whilst that's going on. 
So I think the two together is a bit too painful. So if we see, well, if we see Ukraine and Russia calming down, which may not be for a while, then uh, that could change the odds. I think that the, 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 the worry about Grexit, which um, uh, where, where this complacency is on, the, is in terms of what does it mean one year down the road? I don't know what's going to happen straight if there was a default of Grexit, how the market reacts. But if you have a Grexit, it's effectively saying the euro has gone from a currency mm -hmm. to a fixed exchange rate system. Mm -hmm. They're completely different. And once you understand that, if you are a holder of deposits in one of the southern European countries, do you really want to hold your money? Maybe it takes you a while to work out that actually this, that you can leave as well one, or one year down the road. Now, the argument against that will be, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to get a club together and protect everyone because the Portuguese have been very good and behaved well, and everyone's behaved well. So unlike the Greeks, from the, this is the European view, and therefore uh, we're going to make sure there's not a problem. Well, there's no chance of a deposit insurance scheme across Europe. That's not going to happen. And unless we go to fiscal union or some sort of treasure, uh, European treasury quickly, uh, I don't see that happening. I don't see the basket coming, uh, the, the net coming along because mm -hmm. effectively you're telling every country you're fine and you don't have to do anything any longer. And I don't think that's going to work. What happens if you have an election in France in 07 and Le Pen does well or Pademos? Are we going to say, oh, okay, we belt, we've, we've saved you all, so now you're all okay? Those countries do nothing. So the real danger is a fixed exchange rate system is not a currency, and that is extremely dangerous in the medium term. That's, right. the, that's, that's the complacency more than, I think, the two-week event of what happens in Greece. Right. So Angela Merkel stays, of course, as long as she's dealing with Ukraine. But once that gets revolve, resolved, Possibly. if it gets resolved, then maybe things get tougher. Possibly, yeah. But I mean, of course, Ukraine's a huge issue. I mean, my colleague Wolfgang Munchau has written a wonderful piece in this morning's FT arguing that actually the bigger contagion threat today is actually not Grexit, it's actually the Ukraine in terms of the potential for geopolitical risks. But um, Alex, yeah. I, I don't think there'll be a Greek exit either. I mean, I mean, you could have a middle ground where you have a technical default and then some face-saving resolution. Um, but, but, but in a sense, maybe Greece shouldn't have been in the Eurozone in the first place, but it is, and it's, it, we're in this predictable period between the Articles of Confederation and the United States and the Constitution, and you don't kick out West Virginia once it's in and expect the U.S. to stay together, right? It's going to be a transfer recipient, just is what it is. I, I, I really don't see it happening. And I think it's so overanalyzed and, and largely um, the kind of game dynamics are clear, even right. with the finance minister now being pulled out of this, this morning out of the key negotiation point. But I'm curious, Josh, I mean, when you look at the chatter about Grexit and Greek default, I mean, do you smell opportunity? Is this a moment to go out and buy a cheap Greek island, or? <laughs> no. Might be, might be uh, with the more downside than upside. <laughs> it's a good place to visit. <laughs> Lease, not buy. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't think it's, I mean, to Alan's point, I don't, I don't think it's really significant in the scheme of either Europe or the global financial system. I think people are, a lot of the Greek debt, which was, has, has sort of transferred into um, EC or central bank, kind of arms that will allow it to be dealt with without systematic issues um, if Greek were to Greece were to default. So I think, I don't think, I think it's much more of a longer term issue. I don't really see it, you know, being an important factor in kind of moving the markets. Uh, I don't see it as being a big, um, you know, the EC is, you know, the, the, net, the net issuance of fixed income now is, is, is zero. Uh, the rates are negative. The EC, the EC has basically said, you know, kind of the, the, the quantitative easing that's going on there is, you know, as large as it was in the U.S. relative to the size of, the, as, large as, all the, as large as all of the QE that, that existed in the U.S. So you're really, I think you're, what you're seeing in Europe is what you saw in the U.S., which is, you know, massive amounts of uh, euros are being, you know, put into the system. That's stimulating the stock market. It's stimulating, it's making consumers feel better. And it's starting to drive, you know, asset pricing up as people, you know, move out of uh, traditional fixed income and get into riskier assets and ultimately the stock market and real estate. So I think there's, I think you're going to see a rebound in Europe a bit. I think you're already seeing it. And it, when you look at what happened in the U.S., it, it makes sense. I mean, they're following, it's sort of, it's following the U.S. model right. probably seven years afterwards. And so... Um, uh, you know, I don't, I think the EC is heading the other direction. Right. I, I would disagree a little bit and agree a little bit, I guess. Um, well, go ahead and disagree. I guess, uh, well, I, I guess what I'd say is I generally agree with Alex's analysis of what's likely to happen Because we have the same last name, Josh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but where, I guess where I disagree, I, I, 
for financially, I'd say you know Greece probably has relatively is a small is a small issue, but politically it's quite a big issue, and and I think that political instability, um, the the consequences of 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 of, a, of Brexit are are have there are all sorts of unanticipated consequences that could take place well beyond the economic consequences. I think the economic consequences, in some respects, are the least important ones. And, and, and we know there would be some unanticipated parts of it, but I think the political consequences could be quite significant. Um, we don't know what type of meddling will take place in Greece if, God forbid, it does exit. And um, when you have an unstable world and people are shuffling around the deck chairs in different ways, as we're seeing in the Ukraine, as we're seeing potentially in other parts of the world, um, then you can have very large, significant global events take place that are completely unexpected. No one expected World War I to take place. No one expected World War II to take place. And, um, and that's why I think that while financially Greece is a bit of a rounding error, I think politically it's not a rounding error at all. Right. So maybe it's geopolitical contagion rather than financial contagion we should be talking about above all else. I mean, I must say, I was very struck, those of you who are at Davos this year, and we'll know that once a year the World Economic Forum surveys um, the elite and asks them what they're worried about over the next year. Um, last year, for the first time ever, income inequality jumped to the top of the list. This year, income inequality was topped by something else, which was interstate conflict, i.e. <coughs> war, um, which to my mind is an astonishing finding. But um, Alex, I can see your... I'm just worried, nodding, going, ugh, that doesn't sound <laughs> right. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I That's mean, probably. Gosh, it's a very asymmetric um, set of kind of global instabilities right now, which um, is, is, is very worrisome because by definition, you know, asymmetric means you can't pre predict it. And, and it's back to your, Josh, your World War I analogy, right? What was unpredictable about that was the actual trigger point. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the time, everyone thought commerce was too connected for there ever to be war, but then there was this one kind of super saturation moment, the grain of sand point. It, what could that be today? It could be a lot of things. If you, I, I guess I, I would sort of uh, push back a little on Greece. I mean, I, I, look, I do think obviously Greece exiting the euro and having instability in that country is certainly you know, not good for the world or good for Europe. But when you think about um, you know, militarization of the Soviet Union around uh, Ukraine and around some of the other uh, nations. When you think about uh, what's going on in the Middle East, like were Israel to attack Iran, uh, were there to, were there to be you know kind of more you know were, were some of the oil facilities to get impacted? Although I think that's unlikely. Um, you know those. If you think about China being more aggressive, yeah. You know which uh, you know China is really. Um, you know, improved its navy and its um, air force and its military quite significantly, and is acting, you know, more aggressively. You have new leadership in China. Uh, it's really hard to predict. I just feel like those are much bigger. If you want to start talking about geopolitical risk, uh, those are much more significant to the world economy than, say, you know, Greg's it would be. Well, many of those issues are being discussed over the next two days, um, and I do find it fascinating as someone who actually trained. Um, in international politics and social anthropology, the degree to which um, macroeconomists are suddenly waking up and realizing that the numbers aren't always the answer. It's a wider questions of political and social fabric that are really driving things right now. But that's, that's me talking my own book. Um, let's have a look, though, at some of the other risks. Um, I'd like to ask the audience again to just do a show of hands. Um, and let's talk about oil, because as you say, Josh, that's a key issue that's shaping the global economy and, of course, intricately tied into the, these geopolitical risks. Um, three questions, or three choices. How many of you think that the oil price will be where it is, roughly where it is, in six months' time? <coughs> How many of you think it will be, um, let's say, $10 higher, $20 higher, let's be, let's be a bit more extreme, $20 higher in six months' time? And how many of you think it could be $10 lower. So, people who think that the oil price will be roughly where it is in six months' time. Okay. Um, those of you who think it could be significantly higher, say $20 higher. And those of you who think it could be even lower. Okay. So, <laughs> those of you who can't see, the majority of you think it's going to be roughly the same level. Um, a significant minority think it will be lower, and very few of you expect it to be significantly higher. Well, you're getting at the kind of secular stagnation point, I guess, right? Which is, are, are we in the Larry Summers piece or the Ben Bernanke part? That so might we be have a, We have a global economy where demand is weak and they don't need much oil. Mm. 
or not so much oil relative to stockpiles. Josh, do you have any thoughts about what that might mean for, for you? Yeah, I mean, so I think, look, obviously, we've spent a lot of time trying to get ahead of the, um, you know, move, volatility in the price of oil. So I think, ultimately, kind of predicting oil in the short run, I think, is really, really difficult. I'd say that some of the factors, um, long run, the laws of economics should govern the price of oil. So in the short run, um, I, you know, we have a 95 million barrel per day market that's two to three million barrels oversupplied. And so storage um, is filling up a bit. It's, you know, recently come off, and that's why you've seen the price of oil go up, go up a little bit. But uh, really, if you think about that, so two million barrels, 2% excess supply has caused oil to be, go from 100 to 50. You know, kind of in commodity markets, so what that shows you is that little sort of excess supply, little excess demand in the price of oil swings it wildly. Um, what's happened is that um, the higher prices created uh, an entrant into the market, which was North America. Uh, and so the U.S. Uh, shale was adding a million barrels a day, uh, you know, every year. And the people that were taking supply out of the market, that, ma that made the market oversupplied. And for a number of years, uh, OPEC, which was Saudi Arabia, dealt with that by just taking supply off. Uh, and, you know, they are the low-cost producer, and the Saudis are the swing kind of uh, market maker within OPEC. And so they lowered their production from, you know, 12 to 10, 12 to 9. And they allowed prices to stay stable. And one day they woke up and said, wait a second, um, this doesn't really make sense for us. Like, we're the low-cost producer. And if we allow this to continue, uh, instead of having a market that's 2 million oversupplied, we'll have a market that's 5 million oversupplied. So they uh, changed their strategy and said, we're not going to lose any more market share, which I think was economically rational for them. And so I think really, ultimately, um, what that's done is it's, it's blunted the growth of the shale. So if you think about the laws of economics, um, it'll, you know, the shale will still grow this year, but it'll grow three, 400,000 barrels, and it won't grow next year. It'll, it'll sort of flatten out or even decline a little. And so if you think about um, no other geopolitical issues, no other geopolitical things going on, uh, like Iran, for example, coming back. Iran used to produce three or four million more barrels than they do today. If Iran comes back into the world as a commercial partner, that could also create a glut, but if you ignore, or if Syria were to get knocked off, uh, that, or Iraq, that would go the other way. So if you sort of ignore all that, um, it'll take, you know, one to two years for the price of oil to climb back to, uh, it probably won't climb all the way back to where it was, but it'll climb back to $70 because you've had, uh, uh, you know, so the service sector get hit, and so the cost of production's gone down. The problem is, um, what is Saudi Arabia going to do? Um, are they going to want to teach the shale more of a lesson? Um, what, what's going to happen in Iran? What's going to happen in Iraq? And so you've got something that is very, very difficult to predict. And so I think what you have to do to make money in oil is take the, take the perspective that, um, it, it, you know, is that you'd have to take a much longer term perspective and sort of eventually go back to, the cost curve, like where is most of the oil economic, and most of the oil ec is economic today in the 65 to 70 dollar range, and so ultimately, if you sort of use that as your beacon, long run, uh, you'll probably be right eventually, but short run predictions on the price of oil, are, you're really predicting so many factors that it's you know hard to be right. So I would kind of avoid it. <laughs> Back to Josh's point, you know, the future is entirely unknowable. Well, actually, no, the future is is knowable. Um, on one of one very important dimension, which is demographics, right? That's one of the only things we can predict. And what are we seven plus billion going to ten billion around 2100? And we know where most of the growth is. So some of the derivative implications from an investment perspective over the longer term, energy being one, I think are predictable. Right. One of my oil friends said the best cure for high oil prices is high oil prices, and the right. best cure for low oil prices is low oil prices, and it's absolutely true. Look, it's a, it's a commodity market with a few very chunky players that have an enormous influence, and not only chunky players, but some chunky markets like the shale market. I think the key as an investor when you look at this is to realize any time you look at a security that is in the, in the energy business, you have to compare it across the full range of ways of making the same bet. So if you decide you want to buy uh, uh, 
distressed debt in, say, a company that's been all of a sudden very adversely affected by the current price deck is you have to compare the bet that what you say, what would make that a successful investment in terms of the outlook for oil, and then compare that to just plain buying oil futures, and compare it to buying equities, and compare it to the full range of other securities, because these markets don't communicate with each other as efficiently as they should. Most capital in the world is very pigeonholed. It can only buy distressed debt. It can only buy equities. It can only buy this or that. And so you get pretty big disparities between uh, buying, buying a distressed bond and buying an equity sometimes uh, that don't reflect the same, uh, same future outcome probabilities as, as you might find in the oil curve itself. But, but the important point, the markets have sort of said, we're going to ignore this blip. And what they've done is, you know, bail, notwithstanding all the, quote, great buying opportunities that were going to uh, occur as part of, and going back to our original discussion about zero rates, there's so much liquidity sloshing around that many of these companies that are now losing money and, and significantly cash flow negative have done equity and debt offerings. Uh, the markets haven't missed a beat, and those equity and debt, debt offerings imply that price of oil is going right back to where it was. And so... The markets have said, this is a temporary blip. Uh, we're going to ignore this. And it's made it hard to make um, economically interesting. And I think it will eventually happen. But uh, just an interesting comment on you know, kind of some of the ancillary and tertiary effects of quantitative easing and sort of people ignoring the price of risk, people ignoring the volatility. Right, right. Yes, I think for me, the, the main effect is actually um, for how it affects, uh, if we have oil at this price or slightly higher, say six, nine months from now, how does that going to affect the Japanese and European central banks who react to headline inflation? You could argue that the Japanese um, uh, extra QE in October last year was because of oil coming down. And I'm sure that the low price of oil and the low headline inflation prints helped uh, the Europeans do their QE. Now, let's say going six, nine months from now, on a year-on-year -year basis, inflation in both those places will be much, much higher than now and go on the way up. How is the market going to react to the idea that they won't be doing any more QE in those two places? And therefore, at that point, we have no one doing QE come the end of the year or coming to the end of the year. And then we'll get, then how's the reaction to the bond markets from there? So well, you, you short, that, short the German bond then? Well, I'm just saying, and maybe not today, but uh, closer towards the, if we really see oil at that level, I don't see how the markets are going to have bond yields at these levels when they understand that QE is coming to an end globally. And that, right. that is the global effect of no QE, which could have an effect on markets which are uh, risk-seeking today and have a shock to realize that bond yields, are all mis uh, bond yields may not be at the right level. Which yeah, brings me on to my last question, which is really, because we're coming towards time, but I'd like to ask you each, given what you've heard, including Kerry, about these potential for rising volatility, although we've had volatility in pockets already with oil prices, <coughs> but given the potential for rising volatility, given these mismatches in liquidity with a re regulatory structure um, and a world where it's been, you know, everyone's been reaching for risk, can you tell the audience, you know, what is your top favorite one trade that you would put on at the moment to cope with this world? What advice would you give to people in the audience? Or if you prefer, sure. tell us one thing okay. you wouldn't touch with a barge pole. Uh, I think it's an enormously challenging investment environment. Um, I would, um, we're, I think the most interesting part of the market is yield. Uh, so where, where the banks are pulling back in sort of the eight to 10 percent fixed income space, off the run credit. I mean, again, like now we're sort of talking our book, but um, you're in a you're in a you're in a world where um, everything is overvalued. If it has a QCIP number, if it if it's quoted on Bloomberg, and if it uh, is rated uh, in the fixed income world, and so you have to get out of that world. You have to buy issuers that are that that may not be rated. Uh, you have to do things like uh, shipping loans and, uh, and non-performing loans and other things that, you know, the wall of money that's hitting the market uh, can't really right. absorb. And that's being helped by the banks pulling back because they used to be the buyers of all this. They're not anymore. And so there's an interesting opportunity uh, in off-the-run credit, um, you know, in the sort of crossover space, double B to triple B. But it's, I think it's a very complicated world right now. Right. Carrie, what do you think about that? Um, I think uh, a couple ideas. I think one, you know, with the theme of, you know, I think at the end of the day, liquidity is going to win out. You know, despite all the known unknowns, I think, you know, when you're sitting at the end of the year, I think, you know, economic growth is okay. It's supportive for risk assets. And 
you know, I, I go to, you know, the point that, um, that Josh just made. I think the less liquid, more levered, more structured products will continue to do, uh, to do well. You know, CLO liabilities are one example. I think just fundamentally in a world where, you know, you have so much uh, government collateral trading at negative rates, you can buy AAA CLOs at, you know, LIBOR plus 140. It may not sound that exciting, but, you know, again, you're getting, you know, for the right investor who is looking for a safe, you know, it's less liquid, but well-structured, again, it's been battle-tested, you know, again, it has a stigma, but that's probably why it's so cheap. You know, I think that's an attractive asset. I think U.S. assets are attractive. I think, you know, again, we're starting to see some of those flows where if you're, you know, whether it's European government bonds, we're seeing flows into European credit, but then look how rich European credit looks versus U.S. credit. So I think, and again, institutions, you know, tend to move more slowly and not all of them have that mandate, but I think the pickup and yield and the expected currency benefit of that trade, you're going to see fund flows in, uh, in that direction. Right. Alan, yeah, so for me, do I you see volatility as an opportunity? Absolutely. Um, I think the main thing, I, the main events at the moment for us, uh, uh, the negative rates is not being written out enough about about what's going on with these negative rates in Europe and the rest, and the effect that's having on portfolios. A, many part, many um, investors can't af can't afford to or want to hold any bonds with negative rates. The idea that you're paying governments to hold your bonds is to, to, for their debt is just crazy. So I think, that I don't know how long that's gonna take, but it's, it's, it's a big theme still. And I think that will have an effect on currencies for a while until we get out of that uh, zone. That's the first big effect. So you think that European investors will eventually rebel against paying governments? I, I think that uh, all investors who hold European bonds will, or negative yielding assets will over time uh, sell them out. The idea that you're giving governments, which you mentioned, I've got uh, uh, in certain countries with longer dated, um, longer dated uh, pension issues uh, or, or, or demographic issues is not, is, uh, not going to last. Um, so we'll have to see how long that, 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 go, that takes, especially in, the, in certain scenarios such as if oil goes up or stays where it is. Uh, and the, so I think that's the big theme that has not played through yet. Second thing is um, in a period until, uh, in the next, say, period of time, I still, I would go with Alex uh, uh, regarding um, risk assets are still in a, a uh, web because money's still chasing and I think that my favorite would still be Japanese stocks. So those are the two things I would say. So I said it again. again. Japanese, Japanese stocks, yeah. So Japanese stocks are a good buy or bad buy? Good buy. Good buy. Yeah. So you believe in Abe? It's, I think it's a question of, I think he's done a great job. Whether, whether you believe in him or not, I think those, those, those stocks are going to go up. Right. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with his visit to Washington this week and whether they get the trade deal the through TPP, or not. Yeah, I think the TP will go through at some point. But it's been debated for a while, but I'm sure that will, I'm, I'm confident that will go through at some point. Right. Well, that would be a surprise on the good side if it happens. Um, Josh and Alex, what, are, what do you make of this? What are your favorite, what's the best way to play an uncertain, sure. volatile world? Um, the, the flip side of having extraordinarily high equity multiples that Alex referred to in extraordinarily high stock prices, as well as extraordinarily low cost of debt, is that you get a record number of corporate transactions taking place, mergers, acquisitions, leveraged recapitalizations, et cetera. And this causes not only um, event-oriented, uncorrelated um, equity price changes, and, and by the way, we're also in a world, the, the overlay on that is that we also have a regulatory structure where it's awfully hard to predict the outcomes of some of these transactions. We saw what happened to the Time Warner Cable deal last week. We saw what happened to the Cisco U.S. Food Services uh, transaction a few weeks before that. We saw what happened to AbbVie Shire last year. So when you get one of these negative surprises in the market, all the spreads blow out. And what's interesting is you not only get merger transactions, you also get recap transactions because smart people like Josh figure out they can borrow at zero cost and pay a dividend to their, to their shareholders. So this causes credit quality to ping pong all over the place in some of these deals. You have bonds um, that, that all of a sudden uh, go from investment grade to non-investment grade. So Time Warner Cable, fearful charter acquisition, bondholders all sell, then Comcast comes in, they go back to investment grade, now we're back in maybe Charter's going to buy it and the bonds are, are going back south. So, so you get, and, and you get markets that are discontinuous and don't communicate with each other. So I think there are many of these event-oriented, somewhat short duration uh, plays that, that have very attractive risk rewards because of the volume of these transactions and the amount of somewhat unpredictable regulatory uh, oversight. I would also agree with Josh's comment about, um, <coughs> about uh, non-traditional lending in places where banks aren't, aren't treading. There's clearly been a, a very significant pickup, at least we've seen, of, of loans in the call it 
10, 12, 14% uh, area in situations that are slightly less liquid if you have a balance sheet that can, uh, that can withstand that. Alex. Um, okay, so I'll go with uh, Europe and in two parts. I think over the next kind of six to nine months that European equities, particularly cyclicals, are a good place to be positioned because you've got the three dynamics we've alluded to with cheaper oil, cheaper currency, and QE support. And you also have negative yields driving people further on the risk curve, so there's a tailwind just in terms of a technical shift, more demand. Related to that, though, I do think that it's coming up time to be uh, short some of the um, sovereign debt in Europe, particularly I think the German bonds just are the biggest bubble in existence. The German's bond being the bi biggest bubble. Well, that will certainly be another source of volatility if that one begins to correct mm. quite dramatically, given how much we're betting on that. Well, thank you, guys. It's been a fascinating discussion. I mean, I have three or four key takeaways. Um, firstly, that you are certainly bracing for quite a lot of dislocation in the next year or two. Uh, but interestingly, not overall dislocation. You're seeing much more of a, uh, of a fragmented pattern, perhaps more fragmented than in 2008, when we did have incredibly high correlations. Um, thirdly, I think that your comments on the regulatory structure suggest to me that it's not quite as black and white as some of the reports suggest, that you know, yes, there are very big liquidity mismatches, but the question is whether some of the money sitting on the sidelines will come in next time around and whether new players will come in. But I say I would think the biggest point of all that comes out of the conversation, to me at least, is that it's not just a world of financial contagion that worries you, is also geopolitical contagion. And that, of course, is in many ways one of the most unpredictable threats and also the most alarming. So thank you all very much indeed for a great conversation. Best of luck in hearing some answers. Thank you.